I'm going to start this video off with a quiz. I'm going to ask you three questions about science topics, and I want you to remember your answers or write them down if you prefer. These are short answer questions, no multiple choice. Question one, why is it hotter in the summer than the winter? Question two, about how long does it take the moon to orbit the earth? Question three, what subunits are proteins made up of? Do you have your answers? Good. Let's see how you did. Question one. It's hotter in the summer because that part of the Earth is tilted towards the sun. The Earth has an axial tilt around 23 degrees with respect to its plane of rotation, which increases the period of solar exposure. Question two. It takes the moon about 27.3 days to rotate around the Earth, but give yourself credit for 28 days or 29. Four weeks or a month would also be fine. The orbital period is 27.3 days, but the synodic period, which causes the phases of the moon, is based on Earth, Sun, and Moon geometries, and it's about 29.5 days. Question 3. Proteins are made of amino acids, or you could get credit for polypeptides, which is another level of organization below proteins but above amino acids. Give yourself a pat on the back if you got all three right. Don't be too down on yourself if you missed one or two, and if you missed all three, well, it's never too late to pick up a book at the library. So why the quiz game? There's a growing divide in the US, and in other places as well, between those who understand science and technology and those who do not. Two camps have formed, and I think the consequences are going to be negative for both. Let me share with you the results of a biannual study done by the US National Science Foundation. The poll is conducted by telephone by an independent agency among around 2,000 adults 18 and over selected semi-randomly. There are 10 questions on a variety of topics, all true-false. Keep that in mind, a random guess would give a right answer 50% of the time. In 2006, 80% of the respondents knew that the center of the Earth was very hot. 70% knew that not all radioactivity is man-made. 45% answered correctly that lasers are not focused sound. 53% correctly answered that electrons are smaller than atoms. Only 33% answered correctly that the universe began with a huge explosion. 80% answered the question about continental drift correctly. 76% got that the Earth orbits the Sun. 55% answered correctly how long it takes for the Earth to orbit the Sun. 64% answered that the male determines the sex of the child. 56% answered that antibiotics don't kill viruses. And 43% answered correctly the basic evolution question. This is staggering when you really ponder it. I understand the religious motivation about the two questions on origins, but the number of people who think lasers are sound energy. Almost half the people didn't know that an electron is smaller than an atom. Or worse, the number of correct answers was not significantly higher than everyone taking a wild guess. That's 2,000 people with no clue about basic technology and earth science. People don't understand our solar system, our basic genetics, how antibiotics work, or where radioactivity comes from. These are people for whom science and technology are strange and frightening. In a 1998 survey that asked questions not about facts or theories, but about the process of science itself, only 7% of respondents from the general U.S. population could explain concepts like controls, placebos, or experimental design. When the study was limited to only college graduates, the numbers went up, but only to 22%. When limited to those with graduate degrees, the number climbs just a little more to 26%. An informal poll conducted at a Harvard commencement ceremony showed that fewer than 10% of recent Harvard grads could explain why it was hotter in summer than winter. A similar survey at George Mason University showed that only 50% of college seniors could identify the difference between an atom and a molecule. Some of you out there from outside the U.S. are laughing at the stupid Americans, but you might want to take a closer look at this international data. The only questions Americans scored lower on consistently 
are the religiously charged origins questions. There we only managed to outscore the country of Turkey, although Russia was just ahead of us. The Chinese scored worse than the U.S. when asked about the Big Bang. There were few clear outliers, although the EU and U.S. seemed to be the front runners for most questions. To determine how much of the answers were religiously motivated, a rewording of the questions to say, according to the theory of evolution, brings the U.S. up to 74% from 42% when asked whether it occurred this way or not. Similarly, the Big Bang results go from 33% to 62% in the U.S. when prefaced by according to the Big Bang theory. So some people know the basics of these theories but don't accept them. We're facing a divide here. It's existed for decades, but I think it's widening. There are becoming two societies, those who value scientific knowledge and those who do not. Let me give you the bad news, folks. There are a lot more of them than there are of us, and they wield more political power, more economic power, more popular power, and they control the media. Everyone loves science in the abstract. They just don't want to be bothered with it. Fewer people worldwide know who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2009 than know who won Dancing with the Stars. But these people who reject scientific knowledge don't live in a vacuum. They have filled the gap in their understanding with pseudoscience. Here are the results of a Gallup poll in 2005. Over 40% of people believed in ESP. 38% believe in hauntings. 33% believe in talking to ghosts. 31% believe in telepathy. 26 in clairvoyance. 25 in astrology. 21 believe in witches, of all things. 20% believe in reincarnation. And 9% believe in ghost possession. A reported 34% of polled respondents say they believe that UFOs are currently visiting the Earth, up sharply from a few years ago. An unscientific survey by British newspaper The Daily Mail reported that of 3,000 British people, 58% believe in a supernatural world that included paranormal phenomenon such as ghosts and ESP. In place of science, these people have pseudoscience to provide explanations for the natural world. I want to draw the lines out using two terms in a very specific way. On one side is science. I'm not talking about colored liquids and test tubes here. I'm talking about an evidence-based methodology that has mechanisms for self-correction, that is constantly self-critical, that demands proof based on reproducible observations. This includes technologies that can be demonstrated to work and evidence-based approaches to problems. Microchips, space travel, and biotech, yes, but also academic historians, serious scholars of literature, law or government, any logical approach to the natural world or social sciences. This does not exclude all religious belief, but it does not include fundamentalism of any sort because of its absolute reliance on scripture. On the other side is what I will call lore. I'm using a very specific definition here, pertaining to the body of knowledge passed down as legend and folk traditions. The lore of a people are beliefs and stories that are not known to be true, but generally believed nonetheless. Common law, natural medicine, folk remedies, creation myths, anecdotal recollections, holy scriptures, popular rumors, and superstition. These are things that are no longer based on facts, but on intuition, oral tradition, or a sort of folk philosophy. There's nothing wrong in lore by itself. It helps to bind a culture together. It's when it substitutes for actual evidence, when it outcompetes or interferes with a scientific approach, that we run into problems. A recent email from a distant relative of mine illustrates the difference very neatly. The email was one of the top five circulated on the internet according to Snopes.com, and it relates to the use of an uncut onion to absorb illnesses, specifically influenza. An uncut onion, the email says, will attract bad diseases and turn black, preventing people nearby from getting sick. I don't know how many people at this moment have an uncut onion next to their beds, but I would imagine it in the hundreds of thousands. 
At the top of the message was a blurb from a friend of the relative, suggesting that the current flu vaccine may not be effective at all. What do doctors really know, after all? It asks. Now, onions certainly can be beneficial against influenza. You can have a loved one cook them up in a stew, and they will provide much-needed nutrients during the week-long education about immunology and infectious disease you are about to experience. But an onion sitting next to your bed will not be effective prevention, any more than a box of Kleenex. It will turn black because of the release of sulfur compounds from damaged cell walls. The rejection of real science and adoption of pseudoscience lore beliefs surround us every day. Our politicians have very little time for real science. There are only four scientists in the U.S. Congress, so far as I know, including recently elected Bill Foster of the 14th District of Illinois. Representative Foster is a former Fermilab employee, and good for him for getting elected. He joins the other three, all of whom have PhDs in physics, except for mathematician Jerry McNerney. There's only one licensed engineer, my own representative from Texas, Joe Barton. Why aren't there more science and technology experts representing us in government? My own opinion, because the electorate generally distrusts scientists. Our society has spent so much time making out researchers and scholars as eggheads, disconnected from the real world, or worse, amoral monsters who are blind to the consequences of their discoveries. There is a sense of distrust of science among those who hold the conservative beliefs based on tradition or scripture, and no politician gets elected without the trust of those 55% of Americans who think lasers are focused sound waves. I was astounded when, in the Republican primaries for the 2008 election, three potential future presidents stated that they did not believe in evolution. John McCain, the eventual Republican candidate, offered only a qualified acceptance. Some of this was no doubt pandering to those who devalue scientific knowledge. Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee later reiterated his position that as an ordained minister, he was willing to let people believe they evolved from primates. He apparently missed the fact that not only did we evolve from primates, we still are primates. He also stated that he was amazed that the evolution question would be asked of him. What difference does it make? He responded. I, for one, would like the head of the U.S. military and the largest nuclear arsenal in the world to know at least as much biology as a seventh grade student. What about the media? I think they have the same problem the politicians do. They have to appeal to a largely unscientific population. How many serious programs are there on ghosts, aliens, and communicating with the dead? I'm not talking fictional stories, but documentary-style programs that purport to reveal factual accounts of paranormal phenomenon. On our evening news programs, miracle cures, pseudoscience anecdotes, and miraculous revelation are mixed in with real stories about research, archaeological discovery, and medical breakthroughs. There is no perspective, no sense of proportion. Panic and fear-mongering keep people tuned in and the programs get higher ratings when they warn us about the dangers all around us. Why is all of this so troubling? Because all of the resources needed for real change in our world money, popular support, grassroots advocacy, media access, and political will are currently controlled by those who view a scientific approach to the world as something they don't need. We are living in a society that tolerates but not respects logic and reason. Our schools, our hospitals, our universities, our research institutions live at the whim of those who do not know that antibiotics cannot kill a virus, or that electrons are smaller than atoms. Our government policies are often based on lore, scripture, or appeals to popular beliefs, rather than sound science, logic, and the advice of knowledgeable experts. This is evident in many areas. They oppose public funding for stem cell research. They advocate a teach-the-controversy approach to the central theory of biology. They decline to supply Africans with birth control based on one group's scriptural beliefs. And the U.S. is declining in importance in the scientific world. America now ranks sixth in the world for the percentage of its GDP that it spends on research and development. Our scientific output is decreasing from 61% of scientific papers published by Americans in 1983 to 29% in 2005. 
All is not bleak, however. There are still some bastions of scientific thought left in the media, politics, and the popular consciousness. The popularity of shows like Mythbusters, which makes critical thought and experimental design entertaining, or Discovery Channel's Planet Earth series, show that rationality can be entertaining and still bring in viewers. Some surveys suggest that politicians in the U.S. and Europe are becoming more savvy about the issues of healthcare research and global warming, and the way scientists and engineers are portrayed in movies has improved in some recent films. Some scientists are becoming more conscious of the role of science advocacy, and groups like the American Association for the Advancement of Science are increasing their outreach efforts. But there is still much to be done, and the most important task is preparing the next generation for the task of understanding the world in a logical, rational way. I want to close with a thought and a challenge to each of you watching. The thought is this. Our continued existence on Earth as a species is not a given. There are many perils we as a society will face in the coming decades. If we allow our technological progress to be reversed by those who fear new knowledge, we will be unprepared to face those perils. There has never been a more important struggle for the minds and soul of humanity than we face now. This is a race we cannot afford to lose. Science and rationality are our only weapons against an unforgiving universe and our own human nature. The challenge is simply this. Do something about it. Make a video or start a conversation with a friend. Call your representative or write in your blog. Mirror this video on your channel or whatever you can think to do to raise the issue again and again. If anything in this video concerns you enough to act on, please do. Science and reason needs all the help it can get. Thanks for watching.